brought to you by XMWX Satellite Weather, Never Fly Blind Again, and by the Bose A20 Aviation Headset, their most advanced pilot headset ever. The Corsair behind me is one of the most recognizable and iconic aircraft of marine and naval aviation. But what's really amazing is this is just 30 years after the Navy began its foray into aviation with the 1911 Curtis Pusher. So my name is Bob Coolball. I'm the owner, the builder, and one of two pilots, along with Andrew King, who flies this 1911 Curtis Pusher. It's a replica of the 1911 Eugene Ely Curtis Pusher that made the first arrested shipboard landing in history on January 18th of 1911 for the U.S. Navy. The, the concessions to modern technology that we did were done not in scale, but in safety features like a modern engine, aircraft brakes, radios, FAA required instrumentation. We knew from Curtis, uh, Glenn Curtis's early writings from 1911-12 that the airplane historically was pitch dynamically unstable and there was no pitch feedback, no pitch sensitivity, and he called it you know, what they knew, what a now aerodynamics say is, well, it pitch hunts. And we knew, but we didn't know how much or what it would feel like. And on that very first takeoff, you just drop the hammer, see what happens. And sure enough, we got, got the nose off the ground and it started dipping. And it was, there's no feel and no feedback. And it's the, suddenly you realize what Glenn Turtis is telling you from 100 years ago you're living it. There's no fuselage to either for, to give you wetted side area for yaw stability or tops and bottoms for pitch stability. So the airplane flies at the whim of the wind. If a gust hits the front canard, it's going to knock you up or down wherever it wants to go. And it's up to the pilot to figure out what recovery you have to affect to try to get back into stable flight. And as soon as you do that, another gust occurs, you get pitched off in another direction. So I like to say that flying this airplane is a series of upsets caused by nature, the recovery done by the pilot in the best way you can before you hit the ground, followed by small periods of stability before the next upset recovery sequence. And you just go through the air like that. Now having said that, on a very calm day, early morning or evening now as the sun setting, on a calm wind day, you can get into this airplane and it is a thrill to fly. I mean, you love it. You're putt-putting around the farm fields and over the barnyards and the, the smells and the tastes of the earth, just, you know, you're just kind of cutting through them. The 1911 Curtis Pusher that Eugene Ely flew aboard the Pennsylvania was the standard Curtis flight control system. He had ailerons, but the ailerons were controlled by a shoulder yoke that came around it fast, that around the guy, the pilot's shoulders, and in order to turn the ailerons, he would lean left or right, making the aircraft's ailerons roll left or right. He did not have rudder pedals, in a, as in a conventional aircraft does have, and as this airplane does. The rudder was controlled by cables that, that were wrapped around the steering wheel. Left rudder was to turn the, the uh, yoke to the left. Right rudder was to turn the control wheel to the right. Curtis grew up on Cayuca Lake in uh, Hammondsport, New York, where, which was a huge boating lake, and he just derived that information, the other, uh, derived that technology from the boats. The shoulder, were, shoulder yoke for aileron control was a derivative from his motorcycle racing days. You would hold on to the handlebars. When you wanted to go left, you'd lean to the left. When you want to go right, you'd lean right. And that's why he designed the yokes to make the turns. So a Curtis turn would be to lead it with rudder to the left, leaning over with your body to the left. Then when you wanted to stop the rate of roll, you would neutralize the rudder and lean back uphill in order to stabilize. And then to make the transition back to level flight, you go the other way. And Andrew and I both decided, since we're gonna fly this airplane everywhere we go for our shows, the last thing we wanted to do is to get in an upset and rely on the things we know from thousands of hours of our own experience to try to have to think, well now how would Curtis have recovered? 
So we converted the system so that this drives the ailerons, as you can see out there. These rudder pedals drive a rudder, and conventional to a Curtis, this drives the front canard and the aft elevators. The Naval Air Systems Command in Patuxent River, Maryland at the Naval Air Test Center, they were so interested in this airplane that they invited us to take it to Patuxent River and induct the airplane into the Navy's standard flight test program. That's why you'll see on the flight controls these targets in the throttle quadrant. They instrumented this airplane with the modern digital strain gauges and geo-positioning and synchronizing equipment put cameras all over the airplane and gave us flight test pilot flight cards, data cards, and said, go out and fly this airplane and either put up or shut up, because I told them that it was, this is a scary airplane to fly, it's so difficult, and they said, we're either gonna prove that you're a, you know, a Nancy boy, a weak sister that complaining for something that's not, or we're gonna prove that the airplane really is so difficult. We won't know until we return to Patuxent River on September 3rd for their Centennial Naval Aviation Air Show that weekend. They're going to debut the, uh, their, a simulator that they're building. It's the cockpit forward. And we're going to be able there. At that point, we'll know if we're Nancy boys or really, or really test pilots. I land at an air show where we're going to put on a performance or talk to people, and I'm wiped out. The next morning, the crowd comes in, and they see this airplane. Many who have seen something like this only for the first time, and truthfully, probably will never see a 100-year-old airplane again. And to, the, to listen to the reaction from them and talk to them and the enthusiasm that you get from the flying crowd makes all of the pain of getting there disappear, makes it very worthwhile. And if I were to say that I took anything out of the 12 months of flying it and the three years of building it, it would be that. The interaction, that the, the give and take with the flying community that all of us feel when we show up at an airport with an airplane that nobody's seen and may not see again. It's a pretty unique thing in life to be able to present that to somebody and share it with them.